हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनुरेखा चारी बाग असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशोलॉजी सावित्री बाई फुले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द पेपर पॉलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ लैंड रिफॉर्म्स पार्ट वन दिस पेपर इज पार्ट ऑफ द लार्जर पेपर ऑन एग्रेरियन सोशल स्ट्रक्चर एंड चेंज दैट इज बींग कोडिनेटेड बाई डॉक्टर मनीष ठाकुर ऑफ आई एम कोलकाता इन दिस मॉड्यूल पॉलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ लैंड रिफॉर्म्स वी ट्राई टू ब्रिंग इन एन इंटरलिंकेजेस बिटवीन टू इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्टेक्स्ट वन इज द होल पॉलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्स्ट एंड दैट ऑफ लैंड रिफॉर्म्स फर्दर ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड लैंड रिफॉर्म्स वी विल ऑल्सो लुक इन टू द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन पॉलिटिकल प्रोसेस एंड पॉलिसी मेकिंग वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट द होल आइडिया ऑफ लैंड रिफॉर्म्स वॉज समथिंग दैट वॉज इम्प्लीमेंटेड बाय द गवर्नमेंट फ्रॉम अबव एंड वी ऑल्सो नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट द वे द गवर्नमेंट डिसाइडेड on the form and structure of the land reform had also had to do with mass movements demanding rural reconstruction through land reforms this whole idea that land reforms would help us redistribute the kind of access to land resources that by help us to understand and kind to bring down rural inequality and marginalization is something very important for us to understand in this module we try to understand the political context of land reform in the early decades of post independent india The political strategy of the Congress Party during the independence movement was to involve peasantry with a view to take the nationalist movement to the rural areas of the country. To mobilize peasants, it promised to abolish the zamindari system that had been introduced by the British. The zamindari system was born out of the necessities of the colonial rule, that is, to collect revenue on the land. The Permanent Settlement Act of 19 of 1793 introduced the zamindari system, which helped the British in the collection of land revenue. Since the zamindars were part of the political and administrative structure of the British rule in India, the Congress Party articulated the abolition of zamindari system to gain the support of the peasantry in the nationalist movement, whose ultimate goal was to fight for independence from the British rule. The significant association of the political parties uh, with the question of land policy commences with the launching of the Champaran Satyagraha led by Mahatma Gandhi in Bihar in the year 1917, espousing the cause of the tenant farmers. The first programmatic declaration regarding land reforms was made in the year 1931 by the Indian National Congress in the famous Karachi Resolution which stated substantial reduction in agricultural rent or revenue paid by the peasantry and in the case of uneconomic holding exemption from rent for such a period as may be necessary by reason of such sub reduction In the year 1947 the committee headed by Jawaharlal Nehru of Congress recommended that all intermediaries between the tiller and the state should be replaced by non-profit making agencies such as cooperatives It also recommended the surplus land over such a maximum should be acquired and placed at the disposal of the village cooperatives In the post independence period the Congress party's land policy focused on the abolition of intermediaries and tenancy reform but did not initially address the question of land sealing and land redistribution international context Land reforms was were an important agenda in the socialist revolutions that took place in Russia and China in the 20th century These two revolutions one in 1917 and the other in the 1940s created the enabling political atmosphere for the land reforms in many countries across the world These movements consider land reforms as a major agenda for social transformation The radical character of these revolutions influenced political elites and in many societies to consider the land reforms to contain the unrest that many may be unleashed by the slogan land to the tiller These two events in the first half of the 20th century influenced the politics in many societies across the world. The ideological character of these movements radicalized groups that were in conflict with the historically dominant social forces. The principles of equality, social justice and revolutionary change appealed to many in the third world and the societies fighting for their independence from the colonial rule. One of the key policy programs in the newly independent nation states was land reforms. The national government conceived land reforms as in a top-down approach. The elites of the newly independent nation states were aware of the emerging international order after the Second World War and were influenced by the major economic and political powers and chose to make land reform policies that suit their societies. Each country had its own approach and had a varying degree of success at land reforms. However, there is no denying of the fact that land reforms was a prominent item on the political agenda of large number of national governments in the second half of the last century. 
immediately after second world war japan introduced land reforms it is said that this is the only country to implement land reform successfully in a top down approach land reforms were implemented in egypt after overthrowing the monarchy in the year 1952 south korea introduced land reforms in 1949 Philippines introduced land reforms in 1963. Land reforms were introduced in Latin American countries like Brazil, Peru, Cuba, Chile as well, and it was also introduced in Pakistan and India after the end of colonial rule. It was part of the general ethos of the times. Any talk of socio-economic transformation without land reforms was seen as backwards. Land reforms in India. Land reforms which took place in India in the early decades after independence can be understood in the background of Indian agrarian history under the British rule. In India the most crucial influence on the development of agrarian relations in the modern period had been that of the colonial character of the economy. The land tenures in British India were adopted and modified to suit the economic and political requirements of the British economy. The colonial rule established zamindari and rayatwari and land systems in india to regulate revenue collection under zamindari system the rights of property in land were conferred upon the native tax collector who did not have any direct interest in the cultivation of land as a result millions of people who had been the proprietors as well as cultivators of their own lands were reduced to the position of mere tenants at will on their own fields under the right wary system no intermediary provisions were made and recognized and actual tillers were vested with the heritable and transferable right of property in the lands the proprietary rights of the zamindars and rayats were not absolute british government was supreme it was free to determine the amount of revenue of land that was payable to the state if proprietors defaulted in the payments of revenue the british administration had the right to auction the land in zamindari the area the consequent inability to meet these revenue demands has led to compulsory transfer of land on a vast scale from the traditional nobility to the more rapacious money lenders and speculators in rayatwari areas also the heavy pressure of revenue assessment led to pauperization of the rayat and to the alienation of his land in the hands of the merchant and money lenders thus in both areas there developed a class of intermediary proprietors between the actual cultivator of the soil and the state which through a process of sub infudation grew into a hierarchy of non cultivating landed assets interest they all claimed a share of the gross produce of land leaving the cultivator barely with subsistence british rule in india also impacted on the local manufacturing industry the mass produced goods from the british industry flooded the local markets resulted in altering the local trade relations many people who were employed in non agricultural activities lost their employment and took to agriculture as waste laborers or tenant cultivators on the other hand many tenants or peasants with land had to lose rights over the land to money lenders when they were not able to pay the loans back independent india inherited a land system where non cultivating landed interest laid major claim in the produce leaving the cultivator to subsistence cultivation against this background the nationalist movement promised a better future for the peasants as if articulated a concerted agenda for land reform land reforms in india have been mostly state led and have followed top down approach there were few peasant movements from below that resulted in the implementation of land reforms with some degree of success like the telangana peasant struggle of the 1940s and later naxal bari movement had some general impact vinoba bhave's bhudal movement is known for its employment of peaceful means of persuasion in distributing land among the landers but these movements did not have a pan india presence and the owners of setting agenda for land reform solely fell on the national government the union government set the agenda through its five year plan the basic orientation of land policy set by the five year plans was to provide a framework for economic development and political stability the objectives of the land policy set forth in the national plans were firstly to remove such impediments in agricultural production arising from agrarian structure inherited from the past and secondly to eliminate all elements of exploitation and social justice within the agrarian system these objectives were sought to be achieved by abolishing all intermediary interest by regulating rent and by conferring tenant security of tenor and eventually ownership rights by enforcing ceiling on agricultural holdings by distributing surplus land among landers and lastly by bringing about the consolidation of holdings in india land reforms were implemented by the states given the scenario the next logical question would be as to the factors that influence the state administration in making decisions india adopted a parliamentary system of government and constitution as important and integral part to make legislations and implement policies there are many institution and actors that can influence a policy in an electoral parliamentary democracy 
a wide range of institutions get involved in a policy making like political parties, constitution, legislature and executive, bureaucracy, judiciary and other interest groups. These institutions actors have their own political ideology which can determine the course of policy making and implementation. Most of the political parties that came into being during and just after the independence movement declared their support for land reforms in the country. Indian National Congress and Umbrella Organization for many competing interests broadly followed what has come to be known as Nehruvian Socialism. Communist Party of India the Communist Party of India CPIM were influenced by the Marxist ideology. There were other parties which stated their ideological positions as socialists like the Praja Socialist Party, Samyukta Socialist Party and they too supported the cause of land reforms. The role of union government is post-independent India has been to provide a framework for economic development. The union government introduced many amendments to the constitution in the parliament to remove any legal impediment in implementing land reforms. The union government and the state government are guided by the directive principles of state policy which describe broadly the future role of the state in respect of the institution of property. Now the term property does not occur in, at any place in this part. A large number of provisions impinge upon the institution of property and relate to the following matters. The duty to promote a social order based on economic justice. The duty to distribute all material resources and avoid concentration of wealth which is subservient to the common good the duty to promote economic interest of the weaker sections of society and obligation to assure adequate means of livelihood, equal pay for equal work, avoidance of abuse of exploitation, a just and human conditions of work, a living wage and a decent standard of living, public assistance in case of want, adequate standard of public health and reorganization of agriculture and husbandry, which poses a financial burden on the state and would require a greater share of return according to the owner from the use of property. Land reforms agenda featured in all election manifesto of all political parties both for national elections and at the state elections in the post-independent India. Post-independent India also witnessed a large number of land reform legislation passed in various states. One need to understand why it was necessitated to enact such high number of legislations. The following one can find a compilation of land reform legislations that were enacted by different states in India. Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Bihar, Gujarat, Haryana, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Orissa, Punjab, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal. A very large number of legislations relating to land reforms were passed in such a short time. Let us look into the factors that led to such a situation having multiple legislations. Under the constitution, land is a state subject and the government at the center has no jurisdiction over land reforms and agriculture. State administration has the authority to bring in legislation relating to land reforms. There existed significant variation among the states in their approaches to land reforms and they adopted varying strategies to address a variety of land tenure systems that existed. The laws were amended multiple times in a short period to accommodate the shortcomings that were thrown up while implementing the land reform. There are multiple laws governing land reform because of the complexity of land relations to address land tenure rights, abolition of intermediaries, fixing of ceiling on land holdings and for consolidation of land holdings. Laws were enacted to address specific needs for a particular region within the state. Laws enacted for land reforms may not apply to the entire region and entire state but for a region of the state for varied reasons. Implementation once the legislations had been enacted, it did not automatically result in desired outcomes because state led strategies encountered significant problems on the ground. As initiatives frequently do not find support from the relevant local actors because bureaucratic modalities cannot accommodate the varying meanings of land, plural notions of property, and diverse political economic context. Political leadership at the state level was increasingly provided by landowning elites in the post-independent period. This had a decisive impact, negative impact when it came to implementing land reforms. The government at the center was aroused, aware of the rising influence of the landed interest and this had forced the national leadership to lay down broad principles of land reform policy through five-year plans. Another issue that the governments had to deal with was with regard to the legal questions. The land reform legislations were challenged in courts. The constitution was amended to facilitate implementation of land reforms. The amendments that were made are First Amendment Act, Fourth 7th, 25th, 29th, 34th, 39th and 42nd amendments. 
These amendments were brought in when land reform policies were challenged by the judicial proponent in the high courts and the supreme court. The major limitation in implementing land reforms that challenged the spirit of land legislation to the social profile of the bureaucratic machinery as land reforms laws were implemented exclusively through bureaucratic apparatus of the state. Such an approach was considered to be self-defeating as a civil servants both in the higher and lower uh, echelons are themselves belonging to the class of landowners. The task force report on the planning commission noted as in the case of men who wielded political power, those in the higher echelons of administration are also substantial landowners themselves or they have close links with the landowners. Further, the village functionaries like patwaris, karamcharis, karnamas, sambaks, dalas, are invariably petty landowners. The following section outlines the political context of the initiation of land reforms in the state of Andhra Pradesh. This case study helps us to understand the complexity involved in attempting for land reforms in India. Many new administrative state units were found mostly on linguistic basis. This is the period after independence when land reform agenda was debated which was put forth during the anti-colonial struggle. Parallel movements demanding reorganization of the states were underway. The state of Andhra Pradesh inherited two kinds of intermediary system, the Zamindari system in Andhra areas and the Jagirdari system in Telangana. Andhra area was a part of the British ruled Madras province before independence and Telangana was under the rule of Nizams of Hyderabad. The state of Andhra Pradesh came into existence in November 1956 by merging Telugu speaking areas of the erstwhile Hyderabad state and Madras presidency. The two regions of Hyderabad state and Andhra had two separate governments in 1956. Prior to 47, in the Telangana region, there was a present revolt against the rule of Nizam of Hyderabad and also against the Agitha tenure system. This movement was led by Andhra Mahasabha, which had communists as its members. Peasants from the villages were mobilized on two planks, one to end the rule of Nizam, second on the slogan of land to the tiller. The Telangana Peasant Armed Revolt had been described in terms of its character and political objectives, the most revolutionary movement that has yet risen in India. The militant character of this movement has led to a recognition of agrarian reform as an urgent policy issue. The militancy of the movement drove the land laws to the urban areas and the leadership of the movement started distributing land to the people in the villages. After the end of police action, a military governor was appointed to administer the affairs of the state. The new administration to counter the prison movement announced the abolition of the Jagirdari system. The Hyderabad abolition of Jagirdars regulation was promulgated on August 15, 1949 and later appointed governor constituted Hyderabad Agrarian Reform Committee. Committee submitted its report in November 1949 where it recommended the abolition of all intermediaries between the state and the prison. That all tenants who had cultivated a land continuously for a period of six years previous to January 1st, 1948 will be deemed as protected tenants unless the landholder takes steps to establish the contrary position. The Andhra area was under British rule before independence and here the Communist Party and the Congress Party were very active. Congress Party mobilized prisons to join the non-cooperation movement of Gandhi in 1920 and 21. And by the year 1923, peasant associations were formed in the district of Guntur, Krishna, East Godavari and West Godavari. In the year 1928, the Provincial Riot Sangam was formed with the active involvement of the Congress leader, Professor N. G. Ranga. In the year 1931, Professor Ranga was made the chairman of Ra Zamindari Riots Inquiry Committee at Nalod District Riots Conference to inquire into the plight of riots in Vang Kategori Zamindari area. Professor Ranga at a later conference put forth the proposal demanding abolition of Zamindari system. The Andhra Pradesh Provincial the Andhra Provincial Congress accepted the proposal in the year 1946. The Communist Party had a strong presence in Andhra area and is said that Andhra Communists were the first to organize agricultural laborers into rural unions. The peasant movement in Telangana during 1946 and 31 was directed from the Andhra region bordering Hyderabad state. Most of the leaders of the prison movement in Telangana came from the ranks of Andhra communists. The election manifesto of the Congress in Madras province in 1946 promised abolition of all intermediaries between the government and the prison. The Congress party won the election and formed the ministry in Madras province. The Communist Party and the other peasant organization demanded the abolition of Zamindari system as promised by the Congress before elections. The government at the province under pressure from Communists of the Madras Estate Abolition and Conversion into Riot Act was passed in 1948, where under this Act, A. All Zamindars and Inamdari estates were abolished. 
B. Forest and waste lands in these estates were taken over by the government. C. Riots were given pattas with full rights. D. All the records and administrative buildings in the estate were taken over by the government. E. Ramindas would be paid compensation and F. Ramindas would be given pattas for lands under their own cultivation. Telugu speaking areas of Hyderabad and Andhra were merged to form new state of Andhra Pradesh in 1956. Since then, Congress party had a dominating presence in Andhra Pradesh. The dominant landowning caste provided political leadership. Most of the chief ministers in the state of Andhra Pradesh have been from the ready caste. The other landowning caste that have influential political position and control most of the agricultural lands in Andhra Pradesh are Velmas and Kamas. In the decades when land reforms were implemented, these landowning castes had a dominating presence in the administrative and political structure in the state. These dominant castes, due to their social status and economic power, captured the administration of village panchayats, zilla parishads at the district level. These landowning castes, which were part of the rural power structure and the state leadership, had a negative impact on land reforms and led to its poor implementation. This gave rise to the extremist movement popularly called the Naxalite movement. In the ultimate analysis, land reform is a political process. It can be driven by ideological commitments, anti-colonial struggle, or emanate out of compulsions of electoral processes. The process of land reforms in India took place within the framework of the constitution. The elected bodies, courts, and the implementing agencies all function within the constraints of the constitutional boundaries. The land reform process in India has its roots in the fight against the colonial rulers, the political ideological affiliation, of certain political parties also set the agenda for land reforms and also the land reforms were seen as economically logical to increase efficiency on the land. Before independence, a multitude of land reform systems existed in the country. There were land tenure systems that are particular to that particular region. There were diverse revenue systems and there were different kinds of intermediary systems like Zamindari Jagitari. Land reforms in India are very complex exercise. The complexity is reflected in the way the land reform policies are formulated and also the number of legislations that came into being in all the states of India. And even more complexity is reflected in implementing these reforms. Identification of lands for, di for distribution of the task for legally validating actual cultivators has been a difficult exercise since the early years after independence as there were no proper land records available for the authorities or in some places, available records may have been ignored to favor certain Western interests. Identifying and selecting the beneficiary is left to the officers of the government who may not have the knowledge of the local condition. And also, once the rights are conferred on a certain family or individual, it is important that that particular family is not evicted by force by the local elite. The task of land reforms falls on the state and the state governments are interested with the task of formulating legislations and impl implementing land reforms. This country is so diverse and complex with diverse political formations and configurations of interest at the state level. Each state has formulated its own land reform legislations to suit its needs and to cater to existing political conditions. There is no single land reform legislation that can be applied uniformly across the country. Union government has so far only given broad guidelines and directions to the state on how to implement land reforms through the five-year plan as per the constitutional framework. As each state has to formulate its own law, this has resulted in a huge number of land reform legislations in the country. And some states made the laws that has jurisdiction limited to certain areas and regions within the state. It becomes difficult to study all the state laws and land reforms. In this module on land reforms, we have focused on the large issue of intermediaries, which has really impacted upon the experience of land reforms in India. The idea of intermediaries, which are present within the agrarian social structure, has negatively impacted the implementation of land reforms. Within the land reforms implementations, the challenges include political processes, especially in terms of lack of political will. Further, we also have to focus on the Constitution of India that provides us frameworks for us to understand how to implement land reforms. Further, within the challenges of land reforms, we have to look into the whole gamut of policy making. It has been argued that the reason why major land reforms in India failed is because those who were making policies and those who were implementing policies were the same group who did not want the land reforms to be implemented. As they themselves were large land 
laws. Further, in the challenges, we also look into how social movements have played an important role in implementing land reforms in different parts of the country. Further, due to the ineffective implementation of land reforms, we have also seen the increase in landlessness and also how the issue of caste has played a very important role in structuring the implementation of land reforms in India. Thank you.